So I get to go last. So I guess I took a little bit different approach. I took more of the charge questions more seriously. But um, as it turns out, that probably wasn't a, quite a good idea because I think for most questions, as you, as you heard today, that uh, the answers to most of them are both yes and no. <laughs> right? Um, because I think that it was something that Tony pointed out was um, the answers to that is really going to be um, what you what purpose you build your model for, right? Um, you can build your model to answer a specific question, and that's really going to define the advantages as well as the limitations of what you can apply your mo uh, model to, right? So it's kind of a fit for purpose. And I view the organs in a chip and t uh, tissues on a chip much in that context, right? We can build them to answer certain sophisticated questions that we want to answer in toxicology, but they may not be quite as applicable to other applications, what we want to apply them for, right? And so that, that, that's, those are really going to define are, are uh, both the limitations as well as the potential applications. Um, so many of these already have been outlined uh, um, by previous speakers, but uh, some of mine that uh, coming at it from perspective of the, the group that I work with, the National Center for Computational Toxicology, right? Uh, so we kind of uh, more computational toxicology, obviously high throughput and screening lots of chemicals to try to identify, uh, to fill that data gap and really I try to identify what chemicals we really need to worry about. So my advantages as well as potential limitations are going to be through that lens. Um, so I think some of them obviously was pointed out with, by Wei Shui that uh, for my particular application, these tissue chips uh, fit more into a secondary screening type application, right? And that's primarily from a cost as well as a throughput uh, um, perspective, right? Um, but I do think that there's a lot of advantages to these if you apply them in that context and, and you have uh, um, what has been pointed out previously, the longer term repeat dose type protocols. Um, as well as not only that, but I think I don't, I don't think quite this was touched on as much, but more creative, uh, more realistic uh, dosing scenarios, right? So exposing them for in pulse and, and in multiple times a day, or in other kind of unique ways that really mimic uh, a true human exposure scenario, right? Um, so I think that that's a potential advantage. Uh, uh, Wei Shui touched on the variability and susceptibility, as well as I think Kyle, Kyle touched on this as well, um, and that's really from the perspective of, of chemical specific adjustment factors, how do we need model that susceptibility distribution um, in order to do some of the cost benefit type analysis that uh, Wei Shui pointed out. Because that's really a, a uh, something that we hear a lot within the agency is how do we take that and apply that cost benefit to particularly non-cancer type endpoints. That's a, that's a big ask for many of the regulatory parts of the agency. Um, as well as to model complex organ and uh, organism, organismal interactions. But I would also add to what I heard today uh, a couple things that I thought some advantages that didn't necessarily come through or if I was kind of zoning out back there, maybe I missed them. <laughs> um, so it's better to understand, I think, for me, as we're trying to make this transition to the uh, toxicity testing in 21st century, the next generation of how we do toxicity testing, right? And one of the biggest challenges that were outlined in that report as well as one of the things that many of us that are trying to do that are grappling with, right, is this transition to uh, basing our decisions based on more of these molecular perturbations, pathway perturbations, right? But one of the, the particular advantages I think that these uh, systems actually offer is actually then now being able to um, try to define what level of, of pathway perturbation, what duration and in what context those perturbations then translate into an apical type of adverse effect, right? And I think that's one thing that these model systems can actually help us do is to define that duration, the extent, and that context that, that you get that type of adverse translation into an adverse response because that's really um, pathway dependent. It's going to be, uh, um, as I mentioned, context dependent and many other things. And I think this could be a, uh, uh, serve a big role for this technology as well. Um, the other thing that I, it kind of struck me, we talked a lot about the ability to model genetic um, components of variability in um, these, using these new uh, technologies. But one of the things that I think that wasn't brought out, but I think it um, could also be used to model is, is also to a, to a degree, to a limited degree, um, both lifestyle and other factors of variability in a, in a kind of an interesting way. And it 
reminded me of a study that I had seen a while back where they went into a retirement home and they took uh, blood samples from about 15 or so um, gentlemen who probably had not much better to do while they were um, sitting there watching TV and uh, um, took blood samples and then they put them on a uh, regimen of diet and uh, low fat, uh, high fiber diet uh, and exercise. Um, they took blood after that and then they took both of those serum samples from the pre-study and post-study and exposed prostate cancer cells to those and uh, to the serum and like a regular normal media you know 10 percent serum they exposed that and lo and behold the low fat high fiber diet um, started changing the the prostate cancer cells increasing apoptosis perturbing many of the uh, interesting cellular signaling pathways, right? So I think that you could actually use some of these systems to also model some of those uh, effects of, of, of diet and well as exercise on many of the, the issues that we have in toxicology too by in integrating some of those uh, unique um, 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 lifestyle and factors in these serum samples through these, these tissue chips to see how they impact these adverse response in order to model not only genetic components but also also lifestyle and other factors. Um, but, uh, and I'll leave you with some of the limitations. I think Kyle used the analogy that uh, uh, we need to, um, that, that the, at least in the microarray field, right, the, the big switch and the impact of microarrays came from, from after uh, we made a switch from spotting their own arrays in individual investigators' labs, which that was one, I was one of those, um, <laughs> to the production of these microarrays, right? Uh, well, I think there's another analogy that fits from the microarray field that also fits to tissue chips, and that was lessons learned. And and if you remember back in the, the late 90s, then when microarrays, uh, at least some of the publications, they said, you know, with these microarrays, we can we can define the mode of action for all these chemicals, right? That we can identify relatively easily now over the next three years the mode of action of all these chemicals, right? And that didn't really take place. Um, so I imagine that uh, we can take that analogy here and apply it to trying to interpret some of these newer technologies and, and tissue chips included into a little bit of, bit of caution and uh, moving forward and what they can and can't do. And so that would be my, my um, two cents in that regard.